The United States is phasing out federal private prisons, but does this mean the end of for-profit incarceration? I'm Femi O.K. And I'm Malika Bilal, and you are in the stream. No structure. Unsafe. It's just a bad place. Hell. In a can. Exposés like this one from Mother Jones magazine have uncovered brutal conditions at U.S. private prisons, violence, poor medical care, and dozens of questionable deaths. Now, these four profit facilities could be on the way out. The Justice Department recently announced it's ending contracts with prison corporations. This will affect as many as 22,000 federal inmates in 13 privately managed facilities. A government investigation found them to be substandard and more dangerous than public prisons without saving money. Then came another unexpected move. The Department of Homeland Security said it's considering ending privatized immigration detention as well. And these developments pose a major challenge to the multi-billion dollar business of locking people up. But the door is not shut on private prisons just yet. Tens of thousands of people are behind bars in private prisons at the state level, and federal decisions don't affect them. So with us to discuss, Robin Barnard, an attorney working on refugee rights for Human Rights First. Mark Bartlett, a former prison guard and activist, he joins us from California. Adrian Moore, Vice President of Policy at the Reason Foundation, joins us from Florida. And Shane Bauer is a senior reporter at Mother Jones. For his latest report, he spent four months working undercover as a guard at a private prison in Louisiana. He joins us from California. Guess, Adrian, let me show you this here on my laptop. The United States Department of Justice, here phasing out our use of private prisons. When you heard that, when you saw that, Adrian, what was your first thought? Well, I had read the Inspector General's report, so uh, I was surprised that this happened so fast. Um, they clearly had been thinking about this long before the Inspector General's report came out. Um, and I think they are uh, they're leaping uh, past their, their, their options here. They have contracts with these private prison operators. And if these problems need to be solved, which obviously they do in any facility, public or private, if you have these kind of problems, they need to be fixed. Uh -huh. Why aren't they fixing them? They have people in all those private prisons whose job it is to make sure none of that happens, to make sure that company doesn't get paid if it's not meeting the terms of the contract. So either their contract doesn't actually require them to do health care and prevent violence and uh, and uh, prevent inmate uh, inmate attacks on each other, or the contract does and they're not enforcing it. So my first thought is why aren't they using the tools they have to improve conditions in these prisons? And why would we expect them to be any better in the public prisons uh, if they don't care to fix them in the private prisons that they oversee? Uh, it's probably why we have 20 years of studies that show that Pretty much conditions in public and private prisons are very much the same. There's no consistent pattern of either of them being qualitatively inferior or super. So Adrian, when was the last time you were in a, in a private prison? When was the last time? The last time was probably about four years ago. All I've right. been, I visited, I think, six private prisons and maybe five or six public prisons at various times okay. in the last so you, 15 Okay, so you years. mentioned problems. So Mark, what kind of problems is Adrian alluding to? I mean... These problems existed, these are things that I saw on a daily basis, and seeing this on day in, day out, where, whether it's a, a rise in population, right, whether it's you, you double the amount, I've seen the transition from a small corporation, a small for-profit, to a giant such as CCA Corrections Corporation of America, to where now they're cutting down on food. There's a rise in violence. Uh, there's no incentives for good behavior. The, the lack of programming and resources. So if it is in the contract stipulations for CCA to provide uh, programs such as NA meetings, uh, and they're not doing it, CCA needs to be held liable. And, uh, and, and such things such as a lack of medical care on site. How do you have a detention facility with no medical care on site to provide for those you know, justice-involved individuals behind bars? 
Uh, and these are things that, I, and also such things such as petty violations, to where people receive uh, write-ups, to where now they are now they are in custody much longer, so that CCA uh, can can generate more revenue off that one bean. So human beings are literally turned into commodities. They are no longer seen as people. They are now items. But this is this is a problem across any uh, any prison system. This is why we have many state correctional systems under court order or court supervision because they've failed to provide safe and humane facilities. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a fundamental accountability problem, I think, in a, in a lot of these prisons. And, and what you're saying, I, I play golf with a group of public prison guards and they have very similar complaints about how things are managed in the prisons where they work. I think uh, these large bureaucratic organizations have a hard time yeah. driving things like programming. Why, the reason there's no programs in the prisons you worked in is because states don't contract and the federal government does not contract with these companies to provide programs, which is crazy. I if think I could, they should I only get paid in, uh, if they reduce recidivism. So Mark and, Mark and Adrian, you listed some things uh, there that are wrong, the problems. Um, and I hear the argument that the same happens in these uh, government-run uh, facilities as well. But here's a tweet I want to bring in here, and I'll direct this to you, Shane, from a Poverty POV. And she says what needs to happen in these prisons, these private prisons, she says hire trained guards, run background checks, enforce physical evaluations to protect both prisoners and security alike. And it's that first part about hiring trained guards that really gets me because you wouldn't consider yourself a trained guard, correct? No, no. But you were hired. Um, so I, tell us yeah, about I, that and how that happened. The job that I was hired for was uh, a $9 an hour job in Louisiana. Um, it was uh, for the Corrections Corporation of America. I essentially just filled out an application online uh, truthfully and uh, got a job very quickly. Um, I, the place that I worked, there were former felons working there. There were um, people who had been fired from other correctional positions for um, excessive force, and just a lot of poor people that were desperate for work. Um, and people that had worked there for 20 years were, were still being paid $9 an hour. Um, and when you have this kind of situation where you know, you're not willing to spend the money that it takes to run a prison, you're going to run into these problems. And I just want to address some of the things that Adrian said. Um, there have been studies for years, including from the Department of Justice, showing that private prisons are more violent and they have more issues with programs. These uh, contracts do, in fact, require that they provide health care, they provide security, they specify the number of guards they're supposed to have. And companies like the Corrections Corporation of America flout these contractual requirements regularly. Um, at Louisiana, there were days that I showed up for work where there were 24 guards for a prison of 1,500 inmates. This is far under the number that they are uh, required to have. You know, the state was showing up. They were trying to enforce, um, you know, these, uh, these, you know, contractual obligations. But part of the problem is that the company when they're doing their record keeping, when guards are doing their record keeping on a daily basis, they're writing down things that are not happening. Um, this has happened in uh, CC several CCA prisons. For example, what are, what, are they writing, what are they writing down, Shane, that's not happening? For example, that, uh, that guards are doing security checks. The guards are required every half hour to go up and down the, the dorms just to, to check out you know, what's going on. I almost never saw that happen. And the, it just comes back to the same issue that the guards are paid, you know, so little, the morale is low, so low, they don't feel any reason to, to, you know, do the job to the extent required. And they know that they're not going to be fired if they don't do it. But if they have, if the state has monitors in the facility, as they are supposed to do all the time, why don't they, why don't they see this? I, it's be pretty easy as a monitor to see that the checks are not being made. Uh, and and to catch them doing this. So either they're not monitoring as they should, the state that's supposed to be responsible, or they are monitoring and they don't care. And so I have a problem seeing how having the people who don't care and can't monitor run the prison themselves. There's no reason to expect them to do any better job. 
I'd well, rather the hold their feet to the, the fire to do a better job. Gentlemen, hold tight a minute. I just need to make a little <laughs> space for Robin. Robin, what do you want to say? Sure. Um, thanks for letting me jump in. I guess what I'd like to point out, if you read the, Office of, uh, the Inspector General's report, what was clear was that these privately run prisons in the criminal faci facility context, as well as in the immigration detention context, I would say, are much less effective, they're less safe. And that's the point that was made in that report. And I don't think there's much room to argue with that. And they're less yeah. safe because? Because this is a for-profit company that's running a place that they shouldn't be in charge of. Uh, if you look at recent reports of deaths in custody in the immigration detention context, uh, for example, the Eloy Detention Center in Arizona, which is run by CCA, the Corrections Corporation of America, has had 14 deaths in custody. And it was found that it was subpar medical conditions that led to those, those deaths. And that detention center is charged with the care and the custody of these, these individuals that are detained there. Uh, and for example, one of the deaths in 2012 was found to be related to the fact that the facility staff took eight hours to take the individual to the emergency room, and he died as a result of that. So to me, that's very concerning, and I think... Are they stalling because it costs money? What's going on here? I can't speak to that. Oh. Maybe one of, um, maybe to Mark me it or... Is. Well, I could, I could to say, to say me, in Louisiana, the, is the issue... Uh, let, let me, me hear from is. Shane first, and then, and then Mark. What's uh, happening here with the, the, the medical treatment? Why so is it being I delayed? Met a, a man, for example, uh, who had lost his legs and fingers to gangrene. Uh, he had been going to the infirmary for months, complaining yeah. about pain in his in his legs. His Actually, Shane, coming out of Shane his there's, a little, there's a little he, clip. There's a little clip. If I if I may, can I just play this little clip because I think sure. it illustrates exactly what you're saying. This yeah. is uh, Robert Scott, who needed to see a doctor, yeah. but didn't. Have a listen. Spoke for a while with an inmate who had no legs and no fingers. He had legs and fingers a year ago, but he lost them when he got gangrene in the prison. Gangrene. Mr. Scott complained about that for months to the medical staff at Wynn. They gave him some, the equivalent of a couple of Motrin and told him to go away. Never saw a doctor. Oh, yeah. And the reason we are seeing things like that happen, people online are telling the stream, is because this is a for-profit model that doesn't work. So this is Akash on Twitter. He says, anything creating an incentive to keep prisons full should be avoided on ethical grounds. Those profits should be repatriated for prisoners' welfare. There's another uh, voice on that as well. This is a video comment we got from someone. Um, I want you to, I'm gonna play it, and I want you to have a listen. Uh, this is Carl Takai. Handing prisons over to for-profit companies is a recipe for abuse, neglect, and misconduct. The profit motive constantly incentivizes cutting corners with predictably horrible results. The Justice Department minced no words in declaring that its two-decade experiment with private prisons is over because these institutions compare poorly to regular federal prisons. Given these findings, the Department of Homeland Security is going to have a very difficult time justifying why it is relying on the same companies to hold thousands of asylum seekers, children, and others who have not had a fair day in court. So Mark, to that point, what gets sacrificed in the cost cutting as he sees it? The so, first I mean, thing that, that jumps out at me is we should be talking a little more about why his final point, why are all these people being locked up that shouldn't be locked up? If we didn't have such crowded facilities, we might have a lot uh, fewer of these problems as well. And it's it's that crowding that has driven uh, a lot of, of the privatization and to create more flexibility in the system. But on the, these health care problems me. have to be solved regardless of who's running the prison. You know, California, you're in California. California's uh, entire prison system has been taken over by the courts because they had such a horrible health care system that patients were dying and patients were losing limbs and 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 sick because there was grossly inadequate health care in that state system. Um, that's the problem that needs to be solved. And I think focusing on this profit motive, for-profit companies make the because baby seats we put all, in our car. They make tight. the cars. They make our drugs, our food, our it's water. The prison industrial you name complex. It. The profit. You so know, you talked about the, medical the, care. The, the prison industrial complex being Corizon, the largest health care 
provider for people in prisons. And, and let me touch right. back on this, is that when it comes to a for-profit prison run, running a prison, a reentry center and this and that, so you have the prison industrial complex, the treatment industrial complex, there is no incentive to want to rehabilitate. So they are cutting down on costs on everything. So it is not an environment that is in, that's conducive for an individual and I who's agree, in that's incarceration a to transition back into their communities. Right. So we see the, the cut whole, down on cost. All these food. contracts so people are not provided with proper to drive. So gentlemen, I, I can I, I, Adrian, hold tight for a moment because I can't hear Mark. Mark, finish your sentence. So if you're not providing individuals proper nutrition, people are going to act up. If there are not proper AC units, such as the for-profit prisons in Texas, people are going to act up which is what CCA wants because then these individuals are end up going, they're going to do something behind the confines of walls where they get more time. Uh, the lack of programming, uh, the no incentives for good behavior to where all, it's, it's all about money. And, and to where here in America, it makes no sense to where how we are turning people merely into products. People, that's what we need to wake up to. Then is that how is it that well? we have a for-profit none, prison none of, running? None of the data, none of the Sorry, data shows Adrian, that I... there are more people getting sentences want... added to their sentences in public, in private prisons than in public. And right, so, gentlemen, I, I, I hear the back and forth there. Let me just add, a, uh, let me add another, ask, let me add another take right, into okay. the mix here, Adrian. Give me a moment because I, I hear where you and Mark are going back and forth. I, I, I want to hear what Robin has to add to this. So I think we're losing sight of, in terms of the Department of Homeland Security's announcement, that applies to the civil immigration detention system. And these are individuals who, on the whole, are not criminals. They're asylum seekers. They're immigrants who maybe overstayed their visa in this country. This is meant to be a civil and administrative system, not punitive, not penal, and it's not meant to be like a prison. Um, and what we are seeing is that for-profit prison companies like the Corrections Corporation of America or GEO Group are running these immigration detention centers which are meant to be administrative and instead we're seeing asylum seekers who flee enormous harm in their home countries and come to this country to seek protection. They're placed in prison-like conditions. They're told to and wear uniforms, they're put in shackles, they have severe limits on their freedom. And I think that is the conversation we need to be focusing on. Why do we and have so many of these people in, yeah, in these facilities? Too. Instead, we should and be asking the government to move past that initial decision. Yes, we should end the use of these private prison um, facilities and then focus on how do we put that into action? And how do we reduce the number of asylum seekers and immigrants who are placed in detention unnecessarily? There are, but they're not saying they're going to get rid of those facilities. They say they're going to move in government guards to take over for the private guards. I think Nobody's what the announcement was is that they're, they're going to look at whether they should this, end uh, the use of those facilities, just, which I think based uh, on the DOJ announcement... not the facilities. Right, so uh, I, I think that we should say that, yes, they should end the use and whatever, I, if it's I bringing agree. in... A, if these facilities are ridiculous, mm -hmm. but that's so, not... Uh, what so I'm I have about. someone who agrees with you both, since you, you have a little bit of agreement there. This is Ringnam on Twitter who says uh, he agrees as well, but the lobby is intensely powerful, and he's talking about the private uh, prison industry oh. lobby, which will make it difficult. I hear you kind of sighing there, that's but I want to the pivot just a little bit, because you hear that this, this person saying is, the lobby is powerful, and so these companies are not going away. This is another perspective. This is Dara who says, most prisons aren't private. Most private prisons aren't federal. Most federal private prisons are run by the Department of Homeland Security. And this new memo only affects 13 prisons. So That's Shane, it could, yeah. do you see it, there being a domino effect or is this just a 13 prison uh, uh, incident and then we're done? Well, I mean, this decision doesn't affect the states, um, you know, in a practical way, but I think that we could see a domino effect. We're already seeing DHS considering closing, um, getting rid of these uh, companies. And uh, to, just to touch on the point of lobbying, um, the Corrections Corporation of America has lobbied against bills that would allow greater media access. Part of the reason that I took this job as a prison guard is because it's very hard to get information from uh, about what's going on inside private prisons because they are not subject to public records laws because they're not public institutions. Um, you know, they are very active in uh, preventing people from knowing what's going on inside of these prisons. And I think Adrian is trying to make the point that public prisons uh, also have problems. There's no doubt about this. There's, there's 
problems, major problems throughout our prison system. But the fact is there are specific problems um, that pertain to private prisons. To give you some examples from Louisiana, while I was there, a man escaped. Uh, he jumped over two fences in the middle of the day uh, in the view of guard towers. Nobody saw him escape. There were no guards in the guard towers because the company cut those positions to save money. Uh, there were a lot of stabbings in the prison. Um, in training, we were taught not to intervene in stabbings um, or, or any fights physically. We call for backup, and you know, some minutes later, uh, a special um, operations team shows up. But the guards don't even have pepper sprays or pepper spray or billy clubs. And you know, these it costs it costs money. You know, it's a liability to have guards uh, get in the way, potentially get hurt. Um, and you know, back to the healthcare issue. When, when the company, at least in Louisiana, when the company takes somebody out to a hospital, they have to pay for that. And uh, when a state facility, the, the administrators of the state facility are not going to be considering how much it's going to cost them. It's not, it's not their concern. In a private prison, it is. And these pressures uh, affect how the place is actually run. Robin. Yes, um, I'd like to... Uh, suggest something as well, looking past our use of these prisons and detention centers um, and what alternatives there are. Instead of you know, putting hundreds of thousands of people each year in these immigration detention centers, there are proven alternatives like community-based alternatives to detention programs that have very high rates of compliance, both in appearance and then even compliance with removals for those who are ordered removed from I mean, this country. Do you think that's more likely to happen now that private prisons are being phased out, or the contracts are being phased out in the US? Well, talking in terms of the immigration detention mm. system, I would, I'd hope that would be what DHS turns to instead. Yeah. It's so we don't, we don't know whether that will actually happen. We don't know whether the private federal prisons will then have an impact on these immigration centers that are also run? We hope it will. Uh, I think DH the Secretary Johnson's announcement is an indication that he's looking very closely to what the Department of Justice has announced. Um, and hope we hope that, that he'll take that as a lesson for the DHS system as well. Right. But it is and yet to be seen. And hold, here hold, in California, hold. Yeah, Mark, hold tight for a moment, because I just want to go back to okay. community, and, and then we're... Well, well, actually, Mark, I was going to go to you with this, because you heard Robin mention her alternatives. This is John's. He says, lawyers, judges, bureaucrats generate revenue by brokering deals which land people in prison when they shouldn't be there. Prison is supposed to be about justice, not about profit centers. So for his own case, John says, I'm unlikely to report crimes I don't think deserve prison, petty theft or assault, because I think that person will be too easily incarcerated for too long. That's his solution right there. What are alternatives that you're eyeing? Re I mean, prison and ju justice, yes, but rehabilitation, that's what we need to look at. We need to actually, when people are behind the confines of these prison walls, let's come, at, come up with, you know, all authentic programs that is actually going to recidivate, uh, uh, reduce recidivism in California. I mean, I wanted to touch on Senator Ricardo Lara's bill, SB 1289, which could, you know, potentially prevent cities and counties in this, in, in this state uh, from operating uh, for-profit immigration centers. And so, you know, alternatives to where, yes, we do have, I prefer community-based programs, but let's be real, the treatment industrial complex is there, and it's happening now, and CCA is diving into that. Uh, and I've actually, and here in San Diego, I, there's no incentive to want to rehabilitate. So it's even worse how we have CCA and GEO wanting to dive into residential community uh, uh, rehabilitation centers, uh, halfway homes, electronic monitoring, to where they're not really helping people. So now they're diving into this new sector. And yes, I, I'm glad that the DOJ, the DHS uh, came out with this report, uh, but it, and, and, and with the wording, it, it says prisons, but are we talking about uh, re-entry centers? Are we talking about halfway homes? Because the, Fed the, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, they have huge contracts with CCA when it comes to... So you're listening uh, to Mark Bartlett. He's a former prison guard. Mark, we will continue our conversation online at stream.aldazir.com. We also have Robin Barnard, Adrian Moore and Shane Bauer as well. We're talking about the US phasing out private prisons, federal ones, what that impact might be. Join our conversation online. Thanks for watching. Take care, everybody.
Hello again. If you're with us, you're online. Thanks for joining our exclusive post show. We are discussing private prisons in the US. Have a look here. This is from The Nation. Private prison companies are embracing alternatives to incarceration. Malika Blau, what well, do you That have? is exactly what everyone wants to pivot to online. Because mm. Mark there was making a point uh, about how these companies are now uh, redirecting their efforts. This is Arjun on Twitter who says the same thing. Private prisons now profit off the treatment, the rehabilitation, and the re-entry of inmates. So he wants to know how we end the treatment industrial complex. That's kind of a hypothetical question there because I want to play this video here with someone who has some more concrete thoughts. This is Mary. Privately owned prisons are just part of the privatization problem. Many services are already privatized, such as health care, with disastrous results across the country. Other services include the mail services and telephone services for prisoners, the provision of ways for family members to deposit money in prison accounts, and the privatization continues after prison with ankle monitoring and probation services. All of these are crucial services that should not be handled by for-profit corporations So Robin, she says these things shouldn't be handled by for-profit corporations. What do you think? I totally agree. Uh, I think, you know, Immigration and Customs Enforcement does have an alternative to detention program that uh, they, they run themselves, which, um, as she mentioned, involves uh, wearing of ankle monitors um, that is also subcontracted to a subsidiary of uh, GEO, the GEO group that runs many of the immigration detention centers. So that is very troubling. I think that the community-based uh, models are much more effective and also are more cost-effective for the government. So I think that should be a focus for the Department of Homeland Security and I hope, I hope it is going forward. Uh, in my experience working with families who are in some of the family detention centers across the country, many of them spend a long time in detention. They feel like they're being punished after fleeing terrible violence in their home countries. And then they're released with ankle monitors, which they see as just another form of imprisonment. Um, and they have no means of liberty and really uh, being able to enjoy their freedom. Some, I saw one mother who was trying to breastfeed her young child um, while she was charging her ankle monitor that had to be into the wall um, slot. So it's, it's not a nice thing in reality. Um, and again, it's just generating prof big profits for these companies like GEO that has that contract with DHS. So I hope that we move to more of a community-based model and I hope that's a focus um, of this advisory council that Secretary Johnson has asked to look at this, um, what they do So right Robin, now. Adrian doesn't look impressed. Adrian, what's the matter? <laughs> well, I mean, though the, the problem of, of how these people are punished is, I think, very real. But to to be against the profit motive in its own right, I mean, uh, Shane, Mark, and I are here on Skype. Skype is usable uh, for a television show, not because this for-profit company is constantly trying to make the product worse, but because they're constantly trying to make it better. All around us in our life, we see the profit motive driving things getting better. So but to I me, I'm like, come on, government, can't you detention. use that? Right, I think it's a problematic mode because they're constantly looking at ways to increase their ability to detain people and increase the number no, of people but, that but they can put angle monitors on. That's what's factually. That's what's so, factually so Adrian, not may, true. May, may no I, can I share something with you, Adrian? I have to make Adrian. this point. I've been trying forever. Yeah, yeah, actually, go, go on. All right, make your point, and I'm, I'm going to share something with you. Go ahead. Four private prison companies do not lobby against alternative treatment. Four private profit prison companies do not lobby to put more people in prison. They give lots of money to campaign people running for office, that's what their political giving is. Pri public prison guards, government prison guards, give millions of dollars to laws like three strikes and detention laws and immigration laws designed to put more people in prison. They lobby against alternative, every time there's a ballot initiative in Florida or California, for alternatives Adrian, if you to, finish making your point, we're almost out of time. Or to reduce no three strikes. Mark, Mark, hold tight, hold tight. Let Adrian finish his point. Putting money into the lobbying against it. All right, Adrian, hold tight, everybody. I want to play you this little bit. This is from Shane's um, undercover investigation. Here's Shane talking about his paycheck. Have a listen. Today was the end of my third week, and I got my first paycheck. Um, 
the paycheck, which is for two weeks of work, is for $587. I honestly do not know how somebody lives on that wage here. So Shane, is that, from Adrian's perspective, is that just trying to make the product better by making it cheaper, more cost effective? Well, let me tell you one of the things that happens as a result of that. The, the prison in Louisiana that I worked at had major issues with uh, contraband. Um, guards were bringing in drugs and cell phones and selling them to prisoners. A big part of training was them telling us you know, that we're going to be tempted. I had one, one instructor say, that as soon as you start working here, you're going to realize that you're not making enough money for this job. And when a prisoner asks you to bring in drugs for him, you're going to be tempted. That happens. I mean, it happens all the time. People, when people can't live on the wage that they're making, they're going to find another way to do it. And if you're, you're, the purpose of your company is to run a prison that is secure and safe and that you know has programs, um, then, you know, Paying somebody that little is, is actively working against that. Um, and the, so, the reason that that happens is because that's not your only job. Your other job is also to raise the stock and to, to, to make profit. And so this environment that Shane's, I mean, I, I can relate to it as well. So who wants to, it's an environment that they create. So when workers are being, you know, receiving measly paychecks, who wants to go to work? Who's going to work to actually want to help these people and talk to them like human beings, right? They're going to go into work with a bad attitude. And that goes on to the, the people who are, you know, are incarcerated to where they're like, you're not doing nothing for us, so we're going to act up. So this is an environment that these for-profit entities create by not providing with programs, by not providing them with proper nutrition, by not providing them with resources, by not paying their staff well. Uh, by not providing them with uh, personal safety equipment to pre prevent, you know, altercations and violence uh, from occurring uh, uh, in these facilities. And these are things that I witnessed firsthand, and, and, and it makes me sick. It, it, it totally makes me sick because, like I'm saying, I'm going to tie people are merely turned into items. So, guess I, no I'm, I'm really beings. curious. If, if we could just fast forward ourselves in fi five years' time, would there be private detention facilities, private prisons, or would they be all being phased out? Not just the federal ones, but the state ones as well. Just a quick answer, because we're, we're literally out of time. Robin, what do you think, five years' time? Because there's a gray area. We don't know what's going to happen next, exactly. Sure. Uh, I hope yes. I think that's the you logical hope. step. Uh -huh. uh, I think if anyone reads that, the, the Inspector General's report, I think that's it should be. They should be all be gone within the next five years. Mark, this is, this, is what you're, this is what you protest against. What do you think? Five years' time? Will you still be? Me, will you still be protesting? I'll be protesting until for-profit prison corporations tr and re-entry centers are gone, and that's uh, that's a battle that I will continue to fight until there is no longer when CCA and GEO no longer exist uh, here in America. Adrian, what do you think? Uh, I think they're going to find it a lot harder to um, phase those out than they realize. And I think getting rid of them would be a huge mistake. Instead, this private prisons are a tool and they need to learn to use them better to drive better results and end these problems instead of just getting rid of the tool and still leaving the problems on the table. Shane, you've got a unique viewpoint of this. What do you think, five years time, we'll be done with private prisons in the United States? I don't think private prisons are all going to be gone in five years, but yeah. I do think that we're going to see other systems start phasing it out. I expect that some states are gonna follow uh, the federal government's lead as happens with many criminal justice reforms. And um, states, even before this, have, have been lo looking at it. And you know, I saw that firsthand in Louisiana that the state was, was pushing back against uh, the Corrections Corporation of America. Um, I think it, you know, this was a tool that was used to deal with overcrowding. And there's been, uh, it's existed for a few decades. And we've seen that it's not doing what it's supposed to, it's supposed to be doing. Appreciate your time, guests. Thank you very much for being part of this discussion, Malika. Oh, that enter uh, from James on, on Twitter, who basically answers the question you asked, Femi. He says it won't have that much impact initially, but the precedent set by this could be profoundly influential in regards to each state. Robin, Mark, Adrian, Shane, appreciate your time on today's discussion on the stream. Thanks very much. Take care, everybody.